Dear viewers, welcome to my presentation. This talk will be about resource constraint operation room scheduling with uncertainty. And this work was part of the MOPDA 2013 modeling competition. This work was advised by Professor Dr. Ralph Bondorfer. And before I start with the content, I want to give you a small introduction to myself. I'm a master's degree student from TU Berlin. I'm 24 years old. And I'm also a student research assistant at SUSE Institute Berlin. And my intention to participate at the MOPDA modeling competition was actually to deal with some state-of-the-art optimization problems. That means we're really on the basic problems that uh, are not resolved in, in the modern, uh, in modern development of such problems. And yeah, there's also a possibility to expand your knowledge to deal with such complicated problems mostly and to improve your skills dealing with this because when you when you're dealing with such problems that are, that are difficult in practice, you learn much more about such problems than you would earn in the theoretical way. And another motivation is actually to mess with other teams. So for me, this is a quite motivation to, to make a competition and to solve problems within a competition. This makes me much more motivated to deal with such problems. And last but not least, it's also fun. You should have at least a little fun doing such a competition. And this was my attention to participate at the MOPTA modeling competition. And the short outline for today is uh, that we will start with the first problem statement and some formal definitions. And then we will solve the different cases of the problem. Uh, the, we will consider the one or R case where we consider one operation room, the two or R case, of course, two operation rooms, some pre-processing approaches, heuristic, and then we come to my, our results of uh, the problems. And we also deal with a special stochastic case of the problem. Here we start with a problem statement. What's actually the problem of the whole competition? We have given a set of operations that can also be seen as a set of jobs, J and J. And each operation or each job consists of exactly three phases that are, uh, that are illustrated here. And each of the phases correspond to uh, the first phase, a preparation phase, the surgery phase, and the cleanup phase. And each of the phases has uh, different processing times. Um, these are given by AJ, BJ, or CAJ, respe respectively. These phases must be processed exactly in this order. That means we have non-preemptive scheduling. And we can also assume, uh, differently st as stated in the competition paper, that these time gaps between the phases are not allowed. That means they must be processed exactly in this order without any time gaps between those different phases. And each operation is in particular processed in some operation room. That means in each operation room there's uh, some surgeon staff or operation room staff and uh, yeah, that deal with those operations and each job must be processed in one particular operation room. During the surgery during the surgery phase, this was the middle phase of these three phases, there's a surgeon needed. And this is uh, some kind of resource constraint or resource availability for each of the jobs. In our considerations of the modeling competition and the problem statement, we will just consider the case of one or two operation rooms and we have exactly one surgeon available. This is what we consider for all the cases. And some exemplary schedule might look like this. Here we have the different jobs. We have four jobs given in scheduled in two operation rooms. And yeah, we see the different phases. In particular, the middle phases, the red phases, are the surgery phases where one surgeon must be present. And what we can see here, of course, these phases must not overlap because the surgeon must be, we have only one surgeon available and that, that must be present in all those phases. And what we consider as objective, as first objective in our considerations is that there occurs idle time. Idle time occurs whenever uh, the, the surgeon staff in some particular operation room has nothing to do. This would be this, these, two, uh, yeah, these two times here in this, in this example. And additionally, we have a shift length T and this is given by the input and whenever this shift length T is exceeded, here, here for example in both operation rooms, there occurs overtime. And overtime means the surgery staff in each of the operation rooms uh, 
has to work longer than the normal shift length was supposed to be. And if we extract the surgery phases of each of the ORS, we could also consider the schedule of the surgeon. And this might look like this. And differently from the, uh, from the starting times of the ORS dev, the surgeon starts his working shift at the start of the first surgery phase and ends his work at the end of the last surgery phase. And yeah, this can be seen as some kind of additional machine within a machine schedule. And the surgeon, for the surgeon, there occurs surgeon waiting time. This is similarly like the idle time for the OS, uh, the time where the surgeon has nothing to do. And for each of these idle times, waiting time or overtime, there's cost given per hour. And the objective is to find an OR assignment of each job uh, such that and feasible starting time, such that the schedule is feasible, such that the total cost is minimized. This is the objective stated in the competition paper, formalized. And the complexity of this problem is that yeah, the operation room scheduling is NP hard for more than two machines, and yeah, that's why we're looking for good solutions for this problem here in this competition. And now we come to some formal definitions of the objective. Uh, we define CM as the shift length of the ORS staff in each of the operation rooms. And in particular, the shift length must be greater than T because each of the ORS staff, ORS staff is supposed to work a shift longer than uh, T. And C is the wake working time of the surgeon. And we can define the objectives as follows. Um, the operation room idle time can be defined as the sum of the the sum of the shift length of the working steps in each of the surgeon minus of minus the whole processing times in each of the the result is exactly the yeah the idle time for each of the surgeon for each of the or S step in the in the operation rooms. And similar is defined the surgeon waiting time. We just take the, the time when the, or the, sh the shift length of the surgeon and just subtract the, all the surgery phases from this, from this length. And the result is exactly the surgeon waiting time. And similarly, the overtime, since we know that the, the working time of the OS that must be greater than T, we just sum up again all the Work, all the working times of the surgeon staff and just subtract t times uh, t times the number of operation rooms that we have and what we get is the overtime. Uh, in particular, we, we define the special cost for each of the objectives. And again, the definition, and this would be the objective. We just sum up all the, all the um, all the times, all the idle time, waiting time, and overtime, and just uh, multiply this with, this, with the particular uh, cost coefficient. And if you just plug in the definition of the variables here in, in this objective, then we get a similar expression of the objective function, because we know that all these terms that we subtract here are constant values, so we can leave them in the objective function and just uh, have a similar definition of the objective that is similar to, to, just, to just considering this one. And the first property that we can see from, from this second definition here is that we actually have uh, just a weighted sum of completion times. And the second property is that actually the overtime and the idle time just depends on the sum of the completion times of the surgeon steps in each of the operation rooms, and that these imply additive cost of idle time and overtime in this objective. And that means overtime and idle time is equivalent. And this leads to a different kind of thinking about this problem because we do not have to distinguish between, or we actually do not have to distinguish between overtime and idle time. Um, and this leads to some, yeah, to some other way of thinking about this problem. Um, if we now consider the 
case where we have just one operation room, we can see that this is pretty easy solvable because we can develop an optimal scheduling group for one operation room. And this, is, this looks as follows. Um, we just find two distinct shops, I star and J star, such that this, such that this coast here is maximal. And we schedule I star as the first job in this sequence. We have just one or air one operation room given, and we just uh, schedule I star as the first job in the sequence, and J star as the last job in the sequence. And it's pretty easy to see that this rule is optimal, because um, the or air staff or the shift length of the air staff, and we just have one operation room, that means C1 is constant because we just have to sum up all the processing times. And additionally, the C, the working time of the surgeon, starts as the, at the starting time of the first surgery phase and ends at the last surgery phase. And this, this time span here is minimal exactly if a star and C star, this is the preparation phase of the first job, and the cleanup phase of the last job is maximal. And this is just what the, what the rule says, so this rule is optimal. So actually pretty easy to see. And we also had given the question whether it's better to have one or two operation rooms available. And this is actually not so easy to see because we said that the two air curves is actually NP hard, and but the one or cast we can compute immediately, just from the given rule that we have observed just before. And uh, therefore, I developed some kind of new rule that uses uh, a lower bound property of the two or air case. We just define delta greater than one, just a tolerant tolerance factor, and we compute a lower bound for the two or air case. And if we know or if we compute the optimal cost for the one OR case, and this is just smaller than the lower bound of the of the two OR case, then we then we know that the that the one OR case must be better because it's a lower bound and and yeah, I think it's pretty clear. And otherwise, we take two operation rooms. Um, yeah, and the question is how we can compute these lower bounds. Um, there are some very easy lower bounds to obtain just from the given processing times that can be computed immediately just by some Excel table or something like that. And this is very practical for practical for some common ways to to deal with those. And but there are also much much more difficult lower bounds to obtain. This has that means we need much more computation time to obtain these lower bounds. And the better low bounds we have, the better decision rules there are. OK. Um, but what we actually focus about is the 2 or case. The 2 or case is we have two operation rooms available, and we want to find an optimal schedule that has the minimal cost for the 2 or case. And we just define two types of main resources. As we have observed, we have the surgeon available where we have exactly one, one, cap one unit of capacity of the surgeon and exactly two operation rooms, that means two units of this resource. And my approach was to uh, solve these resource connections with some kind of precedence networks. So what is a precedence network? Uh, a precedence network is nothing more than just a digraph where we consider each of the nodes as the jobs in our problem, and the arcs are precedence relations between the jobs. That means, as we want to, when we look at the example here, we see that there are arcs between each of the jobs, and that, that just means that, for example, here, uh, job two must be scheduled before job four, and job one before three, and so on and so on. And it's important that this. Uh, graph has no directed cycles because this uh, would necessarily yield an uh, uh, infeasible schedule because directed cycles would uh, form a loop and this is uh, not feasible in our considerations. And we want to find a special kind of precedence network in our considerations, but we first consider the fact that 
a feasible schedule can be transformed into, a, or if we have given a feasible schedule, that this can be transformed into a feasible precedence network. So, for example, if we look at this example here, we can see that we have three jobs given, and uh, from the key observation that each job is either blocked by a job on the same machine, so this job cannot get it before or earlier because this is job by this block, uh, this is blocked by this job, and this job is blocked by the other job on the other machine because the surgery phases here, the red ones, must not overlap. And therefore, because of those tight precedence relations, we can transform this given, this given schedule into a precedence network that would look like this here in yeah, the lower one here. And this is pretty easy to see. And now we want to consider the other case where we have given a precedence network and we want to transform this into a feasible uh, schedule. Genau. Um, but the difficulty here is we want to find uh, the optimal precedence network and we will see later how we will do this with kinds of uh, mixed integer programming. Um, and what we do here to develop a special precedence network for our problem is to introduce precedence chain. And the precedence chain is nothing more than we just consider a, a directed path between all those jobs in, those, in this network. And we consider two special types of, of precedence chains, and this is one for the surgeon and one for the, for the OR. Or in particular, we have given exactly two for the operation rooms because we have two operation rooms available and one for the surgeon. And each job must be covered by exactly one surgeon chain because each job consumes exactly one unit of a surgeon and also one operation or OR chain because each job must consumes exactly also one unit of an operation room. And in total, as I said, um, there are exactly one surgeon chain and two OR chains. And this might look like such a precedence network then might look like this. We have given a surgeon chain and an OR chain. And the whole surgeon chain, that means this is the sequence, the surgeon processes the jobs, uh, goes from here and here and here. And the OR chains are given by those uh, thick lines here. And from these we have exactly two given. And uh, the observation is that these solves all resource conflicts that we have. And now we want to create the feasible schedule. That means we want to find feasible starting times from this given precedence networks. And this can be done like this. Uh, we just consider the set of operation room arcs and the set of surgeon arcs. And then we can compute the early starting times of each job by this function. And this yields a feasible schedule. And but the remaining question that we actually want to solve is that uh, which is the best precedence network for our problem. So this is still open, and now we want to solve this with mixed integer programming. And there are actually very, very many possibilities to model this with kinds of uh, mixed integer program programming. And there's a quite good overview of Christian Artigue from the CPAIOR from 2012. And yeah, where I uh, look for some ideas how to model this. And finally, I decided to use a hybrid formulation uh, for, for the sequencing of the, of the surgeon and the OR arcs. And for, for the surgeon, as we just have one surgeon available, he must process all jobs during this precedence network. Um, I decided to use is a positional sequencing formulation for this kind of precedence relations. And we just introduce binary variables, xjp, that is one if some j is assigned to some position p in within a sequence. And this is just um, yeah, an assignment problem for this type of, of sequencing. And this implies exactly the sequence that the surgeon must process all the jobs. And this implies 
um, this implies explicitly the, the chain of the surgeon in our given precedence network. On the other hand, if we want to uh, compute or model the precedence relations of the operation rooms, uh, I use some different kind of formulation. That's why uh, it's a hybrid formulation. Um, I used uh, some kind of flow formulation. What is when we first introduce uh, a source job, J0, and some sync jobs, um, TM, for each of the operation rooms. And we use a flow formulation, where we introduce binary flow variables, um, where there is a flow from, from position to position within the positional assignment of the surgeon. That means we have a binary variable FP, P prime, and that is one if there's a flow from position P to position P prime within the sequence. And there we just have to release a flow from the source vertex of exactly M, that means for all of the operation rooms, and we just have to keep the flow conservation here. And this formulation, because they are binary variables, would result in a flow like this here. And these exactly imply the operation room change that we have in our problem. And therefore we have given, or a solution of this model then would yield um, uh, at least the precedence relations of this formulation. And now we just have to also define the starting times. And this is also different to, yeah, to other formulations that we stick here to starting times, not of the jobs, but instead we stick to uh, starting times of the positions. And this is different from other formulations. And, but we can uh, yeah, just bind them between uh, yeah, with use of the, of the different surgery times and then just uh, find some relations between them that uh, imply the, the real starting times of, for, each of, for each of the positions. And then just the starting times of each job is then given by the starting times of the position that is assigned to by the assignment formulation. And the completion times here, they use almost big M variables, similarly to this before here, they use big M variables that makes this problem actually a, yeah, not, not so tight in terms of uh, the IP relaxations, but um, we'll see how we can bind this to, uh, yeah, to the most uh, possible or as tight as possible. And there we have to keep the, um, yeah, the relations and here define the um, the, the, the working time of the surgeon and the or air step in each of the machines and we exclude some symmetries in the model and just as before, as defined before, we define the idle time and we, yeah, we actually can choose one of the objectives here because they're equivalent by the observations made before. Um, and the next part will be a pre-processing step that will be very important for our problem because we will find really tight bounds for the big M parameters. And yeah, of course, the big M parameters lead to weak LP relaxations, and we have to find very tight bounds for that. And we will see that for our problem, this has a really, really uh, yeah, high computational effect on the computation time. And we want to find valid bounds for these values. In particular, because we consider just starting times between the positions, we can make some statements concerning the, um, yeah, concerning the, the bounds of those big M parameters. For example, we have this constraint here that, uh, that binds the uh, starting times of, of the, for the flow variables, that means between positions P and P prime within the sequence. And uh, we can also find it some, we can also find uh, uh, the definition of MPP prime as it can be seen as the maximal overlap for jobs at positions P and P prime within the surgeon sequence. And we will use different properties of 
of the schedule to bind these to to bind these big M parameters to the maximum possible value, and one of these properties might be or is that uh, P and P prime appear consecutive within the within the schedule because this constraint says that P prime must be always greater than P, and we just consider these two positions within the sequence, and they must appear consecutive in this uh, sequence. And this might look like this here. We have given a job at position P and a jo other job at position P prime. And MP P prime uh, is the maximum overlap. And this is exactly this kind of distance here. And we, as we have to find upper bound values for this, for this big M parameters, this is exactly, or the maximum value for this is exactly the maximum value of the preparation time and the maximum value of the cleanup time. So the second property where we can tighten this bound once more is to that there must be p prime minus p minus one surgery phases in between. And this means that we can extend this bound to this one here um, because we have to subtract all the surgery phases that must or that must be in between by the maximum amount and this must be the minimal value of the of the surgery phases then because we subtract them here and but as we can s but we actually have do not have to choose always the maximum or the minimum values here to to make this bound as as large as possible because we know that all of these jobs that must occur somewhere in between here must be different and this is the third property and this leads to the fact that we can just solve an assignment problem using these different values and then just again finding a small upper bound for this value and this yields very very tight bounds for this problem and this has a very high computational effect and yeah but these depend on the input that means uh, from the given processing times this bound can be sometimes tighter sometimes uh, less tighter and but even these MPP prime values are really often um, even smaller than zero. And uh, yeah, but it comes much very, very close even for uh, some positions in the sequence that are uh, very far from each other. These bounds get very, very tight actually. And um, there are also more pre-processing approaches where we can uh, bind the waiting time of the surgeon or the overtime, but uh, for uh, time reasons, I will not present them here. And um, also developed some heuristic for this problem. And the first heuristic is the greedy one heuristic, where we just um, always find uh, a pair of jobs and machines that, that are the best. This is some kind of list scheduling. And um, then we compute a cost for each of these pairs and just select the one with the best possible cost. And here, the difference to other heuristic is that we consider that we know from the observations made before that there occurs uh, idle time and overtime just when the shift length is exceeded. And we, we consider some calls that depend on the time that is left until t. And um, this is what is different from, the, for example, the GRI heuristic H2, where we do not consider these this time lag um, that, is, that is left until t. Um, just always find the, the best cost for this problem uh, depending on, uh, depending on um, the waiting time of the surgeon. And we, just, and we also com uh, compute a heuristic for, that is the SPT rule. This means we, always, that means we sort all the jobs for uh, processing times in increasing order and schedule them greedily uh, always on the least loaded machine. Um, the, yeah, the results were that H2 is actually the best heuristic in our case. We will see it in the end um, for exact results. But the, um, H2 is slightly better than H1. And the SPT rule is, of course, much more worse because it's quite simple. But, um, yeah, but it's better than actually expected. 
And now we consider stochastic case. This is actually an, ex an extension of the, of the uh, determin deterministic case. And we had given some, uh, some sample data of different job types where, um, yeah, where what we can see here, the, the different phases for each of the job types. And what we can see here, these are ordered, uh, these are sorted by the surgery phases or by the length of the surgery phases. And it seems that there's uh, yeah, no kind of uh, dependencies between uh, the cleanup phases or between the different phases, so we assume that they are stochastically independent. And for um, each of the job types, we calculated some mean deviations and uh, yeah, mean expected values. And uh, this we, and for these values, we choose a, a stochastic distribution. For example, in the literature, they are um, mostly considered considered um, normal, log normal, or gamma distributions. And for these mean deviations, we, we choose one of, the, um, one of the distributions. And with use of these distributions, we generated scenarios. And the scenarios, uh, uh, some or one scenario is exactly the, uh, yeah, the randomly generated, or all jobs are randomly generated within one scenario. And therefore, we have given scenario durations that depend on each of the jobs and for each of the uh, uh, for each of the scenarios. And we have given a first stage variables and second stage variables because we want to find the optimal sequence that just depend on the assignment variables of the surgeon and the uh, flow variables between those positions within the sequence. And we solve a, MIP, uh, a mixed integer program for each of the first for the given first stage sequence, and uh, this will result in different variables for the second stage variables. And we consider average cost. This is this one. And we consider robust worst case cost. That is the, the worst case cost that is attained with a, yeah, with a minimum probability of gamma of the scenarios. And uh, this uses, again, a new big M parameter uh, or a new uh, decision variable UK if scenario K is considered or not. And this makes the robust worst case cost much uh, more difficult than the average cost computation. And uh, we consider a weighted objective of all. And I implemented this with the AIMS user interface, uh, as we were supposed to do in the competition. And this looks like this. We have some kind of toolboxes where we, or internally, we have to, to model all, all those approaches that we have uh, developed before. And then we can visualize this with kinds of charts, as we can see here. We have different codes for each of the scenarios. We can, we can make some input, input changes with which type of job do we choose, and what are the starting times of the jobs, and we have many, many functions uh, provided in AIMS where we can visualize actually the schedule. So I, you need some time to get into the, or get used to the problem, but uh, if you have a MIP and you want to visualize it, this goes very fast in AIMS, and this was um, quite good. And um, yeah, we have some nice tools provided here as the GAN shells that are very helpful here, especially for this problem. And my computation results in AIMS where um, with, because AIMS has some integrated solver as CPLEX, these results were computed with CPLEX, and um, the, de the deterministic case was solvable uh, yeah, in not much more than three minutes. We all given input instances that were solvable in, yeah, to optimality here in reasonable time. And the decision rule here says if the decision rule that I presented um, at the beginning of the presentation, if these were good, except for one case, these lower bounds, these pretty easy lower bounds were good, and the decision rule, yeah, also is uh, quite good in practice. And the deterministic case for the heuristics was, um, yeah, actually there's 
some space for improvement for this heuristic. They um, deviate about 11% for the H2 heuristic or 15% for the H1 heuristic. And the SPT rule is, of course, uh, the, the, the worst of all. But 40% on average um, deviation from the objective is actually pretty good for this kind of easy rule. And now, um, yeah, the main result is the stochastic case, which I computed for 100 scenarios. And uh, this was surprising that this is uh, optimally solvable for all instances with not more than 30 minutes. And this is very good, actually. And as we can see here, just um, two of those instances were pretty hard. And whether the other ones with uh, yeah, seven or six jobs uh, were actually do solvable in some seconds. And uh, so this model is very, very fast. Um, but just with pre-processing, we can see here instances that use pre-processing or that use, do not use pre-processing, and these were computed with both kinds of approaches. As we can see here, for the same instances where we use pre-processing, we do not, we do need about 200 seconds, while the other one was not optimally solvable within one hour using not pre-processing. And here in these examples, we can see that pre-processing is really necessary for our problem. Yeah, for my future work, uh, uh, I will I work further on this problem, uh, and one and one point will be that I want to find stronger for even stronger formulations for this problem because I think in scheduling, this is very important that you find as strong formulations as possible. And a second approach will be that the, uh, that, the that the flow formulation of the or air chain flow. Uh, is quite similar to a TSP flow, and maybe there's a possibility to, uh, yeah, to use TSP separation techniques for this problem. Uh, another approach will be to use Bender's decomposition for a stochastic case. To this might result in uh, faster computation times, and I will extend this model to um, an arbitrary number of machines or operation rooms and surgeons. And thank you, Tiberius, for your attention.